Welcome to Parapsychology Research and Education, Survival of Death in Parapsychology, otherwise known as Paramook 2019. We'd like to make a shout out to uh, Radiant Skies, the artist from 123RF.com, who made this Parapsychology Wordle, which we've licensed for our Paramook series. We'd like to make a shout out to the Parapsychology Foundation and their president, Lisa Coley, who are instrumental in getting, keeping the Paramook series going. And without her, we wouldn't be able to do this. Uh, you know me. And I'd also like to say an anticipatory shout out to Brian Williams, who's um, from the Psychical Research Foundation and will be the co-moderator of our discussion forums and is a font of knowledge and, and uh, a provider of links. This is Carlos S. Alvarado. He's a research fellow at the Parapsychology Foundation and adjunct research faculty at Sophia University in California, <coughs> royal boards of the Journal of Near-Death Studies and the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research. He's the book review editor of the Journal of Parapsychology. His work has, uh, oh, an associate editor also at the Journal of Scientific Exploration. His work has centered on survey research, on out-of-body experiences and other psychic experiences, and studies about the history of psychical research. Alvarado is the recipient of the 2010 Parapsychological Association's Outstanding Contribution Award and the 2017 Outstanding Career Award from the same association. He has published actually over 300 articles in parapsychology, psychology, and psychiatry journals, as well as uh, more popular outlets. And not to forget the uh, many entries in the Society for Psychical Research's Sci Encyclopedia. Today's presentation um, fills in a gap, basically. There have been a lot of discussions about survival of death in psychical research, but they tend to be focused on Anglo-American contexts such as the ideas of Frederick Myers, Oliver Lodge, James Hislop, Richard Hodgson, and others, which means the English-speaking language, basically. But there are also very important contributions coming from other countries, as can be seen by the work of Alexander Oksikov, Camille Flammarion, Gustave Gelli, Emile Matheson, and others. And in this presentation, he's going to be focusing on his favorite Italian researcher, Ernesto, Ernesto Pozzano, who was active from 18, well, was born in 1862 and passed away in 1943 um, and did a prodigious amount of work in that time. So I've just brought up uh, Carlos's uh, PowerPoint and I'm going to turn off my mic and turn off my video and the floor is yours, Carlos. All right, thank you. All right, let's get going. Well, I'm going to be talking about European interests in survival of death is a historical thought. Mainly I'm going to be talking about some people that were active in the 19th century or also part of the 20th, particularly in the 1920s. And uh, I'm going to be talking about several European individuals both with emphasis in the case of the Italian researcher uh, Ernesto Bozzano. I have been interested in Bozzano for a while, as you can see in the, the current slide. I have published several papers about him. <coughs> He's a fascinating figure. If you want a, an overview of his, uh, of, of his uh, work, go to the Science Encyclopedia and check my entry that appeared in 2016. It's just titled Ernesto Bozzano. And it gives very information about his life and publications and ideas. So a lot of what I'm going to be saying here about him, you'll find in, in, that, in that entry. Well, Bolsano is basically the, the, the specific case I will discuss. I have a more general point, and that is I wanted to give this talk because when we talk about survival of death in parapsychology in terms of the history of that topic, and most of the time we emphasize the English-speaking world. You know, very important people like the ones you see here, Frederick Myers from England, James Hislop from the United States, William James from the United States also, and Oliver Lodge also from England. These are very important individuals and just a few, but the main, when you discuss survival of death in the history of parapsychology, 
the emphasis is always on the English speaking world or the Anglo American context, as you can also call it. These are some examples of, of histories of the field, and the emphasis is, is on, the, on the English speaking world, which was, of course, very, very important. But I just wanted to present uh, a few ideas about, of people that generally do not get this. And of course, I'm emphasizing Europe. Well, there are other places that I'm not covering. There is the whole world of Asia, Hispanic America and South America, places like Argentina, like Brazil, which there were many individuals also working that are not that well known. But perhaps that will be a, another presentation for, for next year. I'm going to focus now more on the, on the, on the historical aspect. When I get to Bolzano in the second part of, of this talk, I'm going to be talking about basically his, his work, which was a big defense of the issue of survival of death, of the spiritual nature of human beings, and of the study of the features of psychic phenomena. Big, many contributions to many areas, not only survival, so that was his main topic. Well, he, he also uh, contributed to our understanding of the features of phenomena such as ESP, out-of-body experiences, hauntings, all types of apparitions, and, and I will be mentioning some of that. Well, let me start with examples of a few Europeans to give a background to the work of Bolsano, and then the, the other half of the presentation be more detail about what, what Bolsano actually accomplished. Uh, let me start with uh, identifying a very interesting skeptical tradition in Europe. This person here is Edward von Harman, <coughs> as a German philosopher, and well known for writing about the unconscious. And it's a book on the philosophy of the unconscious. But this is a book that he published in, in Germany in 1885, but was translated into English the same year. It's called Spiritism. And basically, he was arguing against the spirit interpretation. He said a lot of the phenomena, yes, they're real, but they are not caused by the spirits of the dead. They are caused by a variety of nervous mechanisms from the body of mediums. Some of them were just automatic nervous functions like writing without any consciousness, or there could be some consciousness involved, but it was all embedded in the unconscious of the medium. And he even included, included some, uh, some physical phenomena. This is a tradition that we will see a lot of other people uh, develop over the years and shows an interest in survival phenomena, but not from the point of view of survival. Again, in this slide, there, uh, these are other individuals from different countries that had the same idea. The phenomena were real in the survival context, but they did not indicate survival. They indicated the psychic abilities of human beings or sometimes the subconscious powers of the human, not necessarily psychic in the sense of paranormal, but uh, also uh, admitting the, the existence of a very powerful unconscious memory, very powerful creative abilities, and so forth. Uh, from Italy, we have Enrico Morselli, which in 1908 published this uh, two-volume work called Psicologia e Spiritismo. Psychology and Spiritism is a uh, fascinating book in Italian that covers mainly the mediumship of Eusapia Palladini, which was an Italian medium, mainly of the physical type, very important medium, not only in Italy, but in, in many other countries. She traveled to Europe, she even came to the United States. <laughs> was extremely controversial, but convinced a lot of psychical researchers that she produced phenomena. And Morselli studied her in great detail. He talks about that in this book. And, and here he is very much in the, the anti-survival position. 
accepting the phenomena that Paladino produced, but without the idea of survival. In his view, it was mainly the, the unconscious mind of the medium producing materializations, movement of objects, and other, other phenomena. A similar but even more psychological emphasis was in uh, the work of Theodore Cournois in Switzerland that, that published widely about the capabilities of the subconscious mind but not accepting survival. For him, everything was basically telepathy and a dramatization of uh, spirit possession and the like, but not really uh, spirits uh, manifesting. The other two uh, that you see below, Albert von Schoenotzen uh, from Germany and René Sudre from uh, France, uh, were also influential theories. Again, bo both of them skeptical of survival. Schoenotzen, for example, believed firmly that there was like a psychophysical, biological force in mediums that could be exteriorized and uh, cause a lot of survival related phenomena so, such as materialization but it was all under the control of the medium even if at a subconscious level all of the mediumistic circle uh, he and others uh, talk about the psychology of the of the same phenomena which the phenomena were guided and produce under the direction, not only of the medium, but sometimes of the mediumistic circle, but without admitting the intervention of discarnate entities. So here you have an interest of survival, but without the spirit. Uh, uh, the most famous representative of this posi position is the famous uh, Charles Richet, which was a French Physiology won a Nobel Prize in 1913, and uh, it is one of the most uh, scientifically prestigious uh, scientists of psychic history. Uh, he, he was extremely influential in his discipline, and very well known and respected in France. He got interested in psychical research and became convinced that the phenomena were real. But through his career, he, he had a lot of doubts about the idea of survival. He vouched for some, he or she is a, a different person, claiming that he's, he's possessed by a spirit. That's what we call that personation. And uh, he called it a very important dissociative phenomenon. By animism, he meant what other people have also discussed, like Richet and, and uh, Morcelli and others. Uh, the medium and other individuals could produce phenomena from their own powers. So these are phenomena produced by the psychic powers of human beings, telepathy and so on. But spiritism, he, he used the term only to refer to the action of discarnate beings. And the book is a strong defense of the existence of, of both animism and spiritism but particularly of spiritism or survival of death, which are the phenomena that a lot of people, is interpretation that a lot of people tend to deny. So you find in, in his books, things such as this, in which he classify a lot of the different effects uh, obtained through mediums that he thought were very difficult to explain in ways other than accepting spirit intervention. So he says there are many manifestations that are contrary to the will of the medium. There are communications about topics above the intellectual level of the medium. And he presents a lot of examples from, from the literature, mainly from English language sources. He documents some interesting cases of the mediumship of babies and children. The argument being is, you know, how, how could the unconscious mind of babies or small children be that sophisticated that it could create all these illusions of spirit action? If he instead believed, no, they happen because they are really spirit action. And they were mediums who talk in languages unknown to them. 
and so forth. There are, there are other effects that he listed. <coughs> Again, this was a strong defense you know, survival. And uh, these are ideas that later influenced Bolzano and a lot of other people, mainly in England. So that's as a background for the work of Bolzano, because some of them uh, were developing their ideas at the same time that Bolzano was working. So it's not all that occurred before. But certainly, Axakov's work uh, came before and uh, and influenced Bolzano in many uh, different ways. He basically agreed with a lot of the analysis that Axakov had, had done before. <clears throat> so Bolzano, I'm going to be talking about many different aspects of his work, brief biography, the areas that he was involved, his research and analytical uh, approach, and a little about the relevance today. All of these things have great historical importance and relevance, but they also may have relevance for today because a lot of this work still offers a useful concepts, ideas, theoretical models, and certainly examples of psychic function that can be used uh, to argue for the reality of survival of our psychic phenomena in general. And a lot of people still use this old material in, in that way. Let's start with Bolzano. He was born in 1862, and he lived till 1943. He was from Italy. And uh, he was a very interesting guy. He never, he never worked for a living, and he never had formal studies. He was self-taught, but he was a very learned person. He read widely in literature and in philosophy and in psychology. And of course, later on, he, he read widely in psychical research and spiritualistic literature. A lot of what he does in his publications is take cases from all that psychic literature and present it. So that's one of the big contributions that he makes, kind of uh, providing a, a gigantic index of the, the case uh, descriptions in, in the literature. He was very productive, writing many books and hundreds of articles. And he was particularly productive starting in, in 1921 on, because this was a period where he went to live with a brother of his that was an industrialist, and the brother had uh, plenty of monetary resources. And he basically, he kept Bozzano in very good conditions. You know, Bozzano didn't have to do anything except read and write, and that's it. You know, they provided all his food, nice places to live, and he will be writing all the time, reading. And uh, he was lucky that he was able in a good many years only uh, to produce that. That's why he was able to do so much. He po Bozzano published mainly in French and in Italian. And uh, he, he's, it's unfortunate that, that I will say, oh, I would calculate that it was 90% or more of his work has never been translated to English. It stays in French and Italian. There are some translations into Spanish, but again, not all of <coughs> his books, maybe five or six, some of that, but not, not to English. So he, it's one of the reasons why he's not so well known. He enters psychical research in the 1890s, starting having seances and slowly preparing himself to, to study the whole range of psychic phenomena. He quickly became known for his very polemical writings. And by that I meant, you know, he loved a good fight. He loved to get an opponent and discuss, say, the reality of survival of death. And these are examples for René Soudre that I mentioned before, the French psychical researcher, writes in, publishes in 1926 a book that is an introduction to psychical research, and he is extremely anti-survival. Everything is 
explained, excuse me, by the powers of the uh, living beings. And Bolsano writes a whole book, and you see this slide down here, to counter the Sudra's arguments. And he did that with a lot of other people in Morselli, with Boucher. He, he made it a, a life commitment to be a defender of survival. So they were saying, no, this, this is not survival. This is just telepathy from the medium. He will argue, yeah, there can be cases of that, but not all of them. And, and he identified specific cases that were, he thought, too difficult to explain through telepathy. And he thought, in all of these type of cases, we need to, to accept spirit intervention. Uh, that, that was basically what he was doing uh, over the years to defend and survive. He compiled a, a lot of different cases for evidence for it. In, in this one here, this is an interesting quote that he says in 1910 that this Canadian agency explanation has stood the test of time and I quote, far from showing weakness or defeat, it appears like a lighthouse pointing to the port for sailors who are lost in the ocean of life. That was a, a, his way of basically saying, this is a valid interpretation and we need to, we need to consider it. He covered all manifestations of psychic phenomena, not only <laughs> mediumship, but also, you know, he got into hunting, poltergeist, out of body experience. He wrote even about reincarnation, which was not such a popular topic uh, at the time. This is his first book published in 1903. Uh, it's called Spiritistic Hypothesis and Scientific Theory. And the book is mainly a description of the phenomena with the physical medium, Eusapia Palladino, and uh, he defends the reality of the phenomena, but also presents critiques of those that try to reduce the phenomena to only the powers of, of, the, of the medium. And he gives specific uh, cases of things he observed with Palladino. It is very interesting, and but not translated, so it's very rarely cited. Some examples of his publications are, are here. You know, he wrote about cases of, of spiritistic identification. This is a book in 1909. Most of his books, he published them first as articles, and they were multi-part articles. So you could get an article so like what he called here, infestation phenomena in 1919. Infestation, by that he means hunting. Uh, infestation, I believe the origin for that is, is may, may be religious because infestation, of course, it has a negative implication. It's almost like a disease. And it's because, you know, people used to believe that a house that is haunted is kind of infested, is possessed by bad influences. And I think that's the origin of, of that term. But anyhow, this, this, is, this he published in 1919, and later he revised the book several times. But before it appeared in articles, a very long article with the same title that came out in parts, like seven or eight parts. So it was a whole year of the journal, or sometimes two years, and the article kept appearing with cases and more and more arguments. Right. A very, a very famous book of his is this one in 1941, a Primitive People and Supernormal Manifestations. And it's this one that you see here. It's about the, how psychic phenomena have been reported in so-called primitive people. And uh, in, in other cultures, you know, in jungle and in faraway uh, places from, <coughs> From, um, from modern societies, and uh, how that shows the, the reality of the phenomena and how these beliefs have affected the development of religious and spiritual ideas. There were a few things published in English in terms of articles, and these are 
you know, some uh, examples. This one in 1907, for example, symbolism and metapsychical phenomena. Fascinating article discussing the different ways in which symbols were involved with in psychic phenomena, such as dreams about the future or visions, what type of symbols uh, sometimes appear to represent something such as the concept of death, Sometimes, you know, you will not dream directly about someone dying, but you will see something like a, like a black bird, like a skull, and later that seems to correspond to the moment that someone died. And that, that's just one general example. He presented many descriptions and show how these things work. This is an article that appeared between 1909 and 1910. It's a long, one of these very long articles that later made it into a book. And here he classifies all kinds of mediumistic, but also some apparition and phenomena that he thinks provided uh, evidence for, for survival, such as mediumistic communications in other languages or coming via children or with identical calligraphy, by that meaning that the medium will write something, and when you see the handwriting of the medium, it's very similar to the handwriting of the person that is communicating, you know, when they were able to find letters or things that survived in the individual. And, uh, and he, he, he enjoyed very much to classify the phenomena in the same way that Aksakov had already done in 1890, but he continued doing it in an even more systematic way in later years. He was publishing about all kinds of unusual uh, phenomena. <laughs> he has one, uh, one interesting article here, materializations of phantasms, minuscule proportions. <laughs> These are cases of materializations in the seance room, the context of, of spiritualist uh, seances. But the materializations, instead of being of normal size, were really small, so, such as like a foot high, or sometimes bigger, but uh, kind of very small. He, he liked to discuss things like that that were weird, even within the literature of psychic phenomena. That's also one of the reasons why I enjoy so much his, his work. Because there is really so much to, to learn from him. He compiled many cases of mediumistic communications of the living. You know, mediums that instead of channeling someone that had died, they were manifesting someone that was still alive. And of course, that was not a problem for Bolsano because if he, like Aksakov and others before, will argue, hey, the human spirit is the same during life after death. So you can get psychic influences on mediums from living people, and that will account for some of these uh, fascinating communications. Going back to how he did his work, what was his, his method? Basically, what he did was bibliographical research. He, he didn't collect original cases himself, and uh, he didn't do much in terms of, of experiments or the like at the beginning. And through his life, he attended a lot of seances. But the bulk of his work was really compiling information from published cases and organizing that information into things that made sense to describe the phenomena and to defend the idea of survival. So he did a lot of work with classification. Every phenomena he discussed, hauntings, apparitions, communication, communication out-of-body experiences, he classified them and argued that every phenomena had different ways of manifesting had varieties inside their manifestations, and that there were gradations of phenomena, starting from really weak to really strong, or examples that, that had no much survival content, but through start analyzing the cases, 
eventually some cases appeared that were more stronger supporting the idea of survival. And he was always defending the reality of extermination. He made a lot about the principle of convergence of proof. And that meant when you classify all these phenomena and you compare all the different types and gradations of phenomena, he says that they will support each other, not only in terms of the existence of the phenomena, but also in terms of the idea of spirituality and survival of them. And that was a point that he made almost in every one of his monographs and, and stories. This is a story that was uh, published in Italy about the life and work of Ernesto Bozzano <coughs> by Giovanni Gianuzzo. She's a, an Italian psychiatrist. And uh, basically he said, he, he said, Bozzano considered paranormal phenomena as natural objects to be classified. That was his emphasis on, on classification. But at the same time, he said that that was kind of an old fashioned approach at the time. And uh, that produced a separation between his work and the work of others. In a way, that is, that is true. But on, another, on another side, that's what I think makes Bozzano work so interesting and valuable to us today. Those classifications provide so much information that they are not just a brief superficial description of a few cases or premonitions or mediumship, or you get a lot of information about the structure of the phenomena, the different ways in which it manifests. So it, I think it, it, it provided us with a lot of very useful information. This is an example of his classifications. This is a book that came out in 1947 after he died. He, he had the tendency of, after he published a monograph on a topic, he, he went back and will revise it. And by that, I mean that he will add cases. He never changed his basic interpretation, but he added new cases that had appeared in the last 10 years of the publication of the first edition. And he brought then another edition with many more cases. Uh, several of these manuscripts remain unpublished when he died and were published uh, later on after his death. This one is probably the most, is the most detailed examination I have ever seen of the phenomena of premonitions. And you can see how, how he classified them. First are cases of premonitions about the self, of, of infirmity, meaning disease or problems, or about death. Then premonitions of infirmity and of death, but about other people. First one was about yourself, which is about other people. And then premonitions about different events. And if you can see inside each of these three points, they are different ways in which the, the premonitions appear. And he analyzes a lot of cases of dreams, but also cases in which the person was awake and had different types of experiences about the future. And he, he tries to understand the phenomena in great detail. This is not a particular survival study, but it's interesting to show his approach. More into survival was his interest in deathbed visions. And uh, <coughs> he starts publishing around 1906 article appears in English. It had first appeared in Italian. And here you see a classification of the phenomenon of deathbed visions, which is a phenomenon you know, when someone is dying and is on a bed. So you will see visions of spirits of the dead. And, uh, and he classifies them in different ways. And those cases that are seen only by the dying, but then there are cases that are seen also the apparitions are seen by the persons around the death. We found a few cases and information obtained from those descriptions and visions 
uh, coincided in different ways with information that came through mediums and so forth. So, you know, he, he, he brings, he makes his point, he classifies them, and then under each heading, he presents different case description. And at the end, he brings it all together and makes the argument, this, this all converges to show that there is, there is a spiritual reality behind this phenomenon. And that, that was the approach that he took with almost all the other phenomena. But in the process, he uncovered fascinating cases. Uh, they say a lot about how psychic phenomena are manifest. A particularly interesting one is this, this book called The Phenomena of Hunting. This is the French, the first time it appears in the, as a French book in 1920. It had appeared before in 19. 1919 in Italian, and even before that in parts in a journal article. Here you see how he organized the chapters of the book, like auditory hand hauntings, visual hauntings, cases of telepathy between the living in relation to hauntings, and so forth. This cosmetic, including uh, poltergeist cases, which are more person center as opposed to place center that were the phenomena of haunting. Also Bolsano doesn't always make it that way. He he makes the claim that he compiled five hundred and thirty two cases that have been published before. And that's very interesting because you know at that time no one had analyzed so many cases. It is unfortunate that he doesn't identify those cases in the book. One thing I would have loved to see was an appendix or a section in which he will say, these are all the cases and, and state where he found them. He certainly had the references in you know, the books, the, the articles and so forth. And uh, I was recently trying to find out try, if, if that information has survived. In Italy, there is a foundation, it's called the Bozzano de Boni Foundation, that basically formed originally to preserve the legacy of Bozzano. And its library still existing and is in that place. It's a place in Bologna, in Italy. And I was, uh, Nancy and I were able to visit there, uh, and it's an amazing place. And uh, what I will learn, I and they have correspondence, they have the books. It's, it's really amazing. And I was asking someone that knows that place via email if that if there if there are records of the actual cases. And unfortunately, he said no, there are no not records. He said at one point they were trying to prepare something about Bolsano, and they were looking in, in the archival material to see if they could find that information and they were not successful. So I'm afraid to say that that has been lost uh, to us. But other people have done other things like that later on. But still he presents some analysis uh, that are interesting. You know, out of those cases, he says those that are proper hauntings were 374. And and then he gives us these these numbers, you know, that in 180 cases, the where where about tragic events that form 48 percent of the total number of hauntings. In some cases, bodies were found in the place. That means they were bodies were buried under the house or close by. 27 cases or seven percent cases with with death and you know he, he, he gives different types of death <coughs> and some his argument is that some type of death was related in the majority of cases so 304 or 81 percent of all these hunting cases some form of death was involved which he uses of course to support the idea of this kind of agency He says that there were 311 cases of phantasms. Phantasms, but that he means apparitions, mainly visual, visual apparitions. 
So, so he says that 76 were recognized cases when, where the appearance of the phantasm was, was uh, recognized on site. Others were identified by portraits or descriptions. And then different other things, like in 114, the apparition seemed to perceive the person's presence and, and so forth. Again, a very useful type of analysis and the type of thing that we could also still be doing today. It will be fascinating to do it with new cases and, and see what we can find. At the end of the book, you know, he basically brings out different interpretations. You want to spirit agency, living agency, and psychometric impressions. A living agency, he talks more about you know, phenomena produced by telepathy from the living or other other forms of telepathy or, or psychokinetic agency from the living. And, and he says that his cases really, there were only about two cases he said that, that perhaps could be explained easily like that, but it, it didn't seem to be, to him, to be a, a valid explanation. He prefers spirit agency, account for them. He, he also discusses the psychometric theory of hauntings. This idea, you know, the idea of psychometry, uh, an object or a house can store psychic impressions related to an individual. So if you hold an object, you can tell things about a person, the state of health, the name, all kinds of things. The psychometric explanation of hauntings is that in certain ha places, something happens that is so emotionally intense, like someone gets murdered or people are suffering or something, and it gets imprinted in the, in the room, in the house. And when people come in and have the ability to decode that information, that's what a haunting is. But that doesn't mean that there are real spirits in the place. This is a, a very old uh, explanation. And again, he doesn't find, he, in fact, in the, in the chapter, he presents like 10 different points that go against that explanation for a lot of cases. So he says there are a few cases uh, that that may be applied. In his view, spirit agency could be explained by telepathy, but not between the living. He says dead people can telepathically affect living people. So when you see an apparition or you hear strange sounds or voices, that could be telepathy from a disconnect source. Or he says that it could be the people present who have mediumistic ability and the spirits could affect the people in the house via a medium. But in both cases, the the origin of the manifestations will be someone that had died. That was, that was his idea about hunting. He also studied what he called polyglot uh, mediumship. And this is an interesting book that is about the phenomena of xenoglossy or when mediums talk or write or do something in languages that they do not know. And he classified them in different way, you know, some some of the mediums we speak or we hear things in languages that did not know, they produce writing, direct voice, those were the few cases where things were heard in the middle of the sense, or direct writing against writing appearing in words or paper or slates and and so forth. Again it's an, another example of the classified defense of violence. This is a particularly interesting one about musical phenomena. Musica transcendentale. It's a, a transcendental music, 1943. It talks about different musical phenomena. The first one are basically mediums that produce music. So someone that, that is not a piano player, but is a medium and during the sense, it gets possessed or it changes and it goes, sits on the piano and performs. 
And that happens with different instruments and the like. But even more interesting like that, uh, but if he believes are cases of telepathically perceived uh, music or music heard during hauntings, music heard at deathbeds, those are fascinating. There are some very interesting cases, which some of which are even collective, in which not only the person that is dying hears the music, but other people around also do. And uh, the music is, is mainly described as a choir angels, uh, very beautiful uh, type of uh, music. It's a very, it's a, one of these phenomena uh, that has been uh, kind of neglected in a general way. Very, very few individuals have followed it up, but there has been uh, some interest. The phenomenon of bilocation it was a particular interest of mine. And at one point I wrote a paper about about Bolsano's work in this area. He basically presented a classification arguing that by, by location was a separation from the body, an, an, an etheric body that could carry consciousness, an out of body experience in which consciousness really goes out. But he started with cases of phantom limb sensations of amputees, people that have lost limbs and still feel that their hand is there and they had lost it. With the whole idea that, yeah, you feel that because there is there is something there at a subtle different level. Visions of the self while the consciousness remain in the physical body. These are the cases that in psychiatry are called autoscope. That means that you see a phantom of yourself approaching. These cases are studied by psychologists and psychiatrists, but they don't assume that there is really nothing more than just hallucination. He said those were examples <coughs> of the projection of something. And then cases in which consciousness actually left the physical body, out of body and near death experiences, and cases of phantoms of the living that were perceived by someone else. Physical were apparitions seen at a distance. He put all that together in various papers and books and made the argument that these things were related to the spiritual nature of man and eventually it provided survival. Yeah. Here is, is kind of the art of the, of the, the argument. He focuses uh, particularly on the bystander deathbed perceptions, meaning when someone is dying, not only the dying person is experiencing something, but the people around also sometimes experience things. Such as you see in this illustration here, it's an old illustration in the 19th century, and there have been cases where the people around the deathbed see a, a spirit floating or coming out of the body of the dying person. And many other times they see lights or, or they see clouds in vapor or mist. And these things are still being reported uh, today. So he basically argued that all these phenomena were related and and that uh, they indicated the survival of death. He also studied physical phenomena around the time of death. This is a book that came out in 1948, again after he had he had died in 43. But it, it was published with new cases after his death. And these are cases of pictures that fall, clocks that stop and start, and many other physical manifestations that coincide with a, a, someone dying at a distance. And here I also wrote a paper about this I published in 2007, trying to rescue this work from oblivion, because it's, it's really not, not, almost not known at all that Bolsano dealt with this case, and he described them in great detail. Camille Flammarion, that I mentioned before, eh, also he eh, presented a lot of cases. Uh, Bolsano argued that, that almost all the phenomena that he studied converge in the experimental demonstration of the existence and the survival of the soul. This is a quote from him. And, uh, and that 
to arrive at that, uh, at that uh, conclusion, he included bo both the powers of the living and the powers of the dead. He says that in reality, the distinction between is this phenomena caused by a, a dead, the spirit of a dead person or by a living person, he said that distinction was not really a, not a real one because in both cases, what was causing the phenomena was a spirit. But in one case, it was from living persons. In others, it was from dead persons, but it's the same source, the same agent. And, and that was something that he, that he, what can we conclude about Bolsonaro? Well, I, I, I personally think he reminds us of the richness of cases of psychic phenomena. The way he presents and analyzes them shows that there is a lot of fascinating material out there that psychic phenomena are not just simple manifestations, but they have a great variety of ways to manifest. Some of them are auditory. Some of them are visual. Some of them are very subtle. All these are extremely strong, and you know you get a table jumping and breaking. In other cases, you just get a slight sound, but it all has a similar cause. He gave us in when when you see open his books and articles, I, he gives us an index to find cases from the literature, especially the literature before 1940. If you are looking for cases of out of body experiences. You go to his book and, and you find out he usually gives the source, not in a very accurate way, but accurate enough, he gives you the year and the book title or the name of the journal and the year and sometimes a volume number. And you can trace the cases generally following him. And that's, that's very useful to do because the old literature is still not very well indexed. And that happens in, a, in every field uh, that you get into, we have very powerful databases today, everything computerized, but all of that we get is mainly the modern literature, maybe from the 1950s to the present. Some, some databases go farther back, but it's rare to find very good databases that will allow you to, to go into the 19th century or the 1920s and and find out the details about, about the literature. And his books and articles are a big help uh, to do that. He, he presented us with many observations and arguments supporting survival of death that are worth uh, considering. And I will argue that some of his ideas may be followed today using both statistical, but also qualitative analysis. <coughs> to inspire a new work. Basically, if those phenomena existed before and he recorded them, we should be able to find examples today, and actually I think we do, and describe them in more detail. And some people have, have done that, uh, showing that this seems a lot of these phenomena, like the near-death experiences, hauntings, and the like, are still happening. But I will go more and say, yeah, but we, we need to analyze in more detail like he was doing. And now with all the techniques that we have at our disposal, we could do so much more. On a more general way, and, and more from the more abstract uh, position of history, I think he's a very useful historical case story of bibliographical approaches, sometimes on critical acceptance of cases because he, he was not sometimes very careful in what cases he accepted as evidence. Basically, he accepted almost anything that had been published. So most probably there is some uh, some error or maybe a lot of error in in the cases that he used. But his assumption was that when you get a lot of cases, that may cancel all the errors and commonalities will tend to come to the surface and you will be able to, to make a general conclusion. It also provides us, you know, with examples of how people will argue the phenomenon and so forth. But that's a more abstract thing, not generally related to the topic and kind of survival. So with that, I want to conclude uh, Bolsano. 
is it's very difficult to discuss because he did so much and there is so much detail in his work. And as you can see, I have, I have tried to go fast through a lot of different aspects of his work. But I, I hope that you get a good feeling of the topics he covered, how he did it, and his main conclusion, and see him as, as a very important representative of the idea of, this, of survival of death in the European context. Here you'll find a, the place I mentioned before that is a foundation that has Bolsano's uh, library. And uh, this, this link here is uh, for one of the most, or perhaps the most complete bibliography of Bolsano that is available today. If you go here, you see publications in Italian, French, English, and in other languages. Some of them are translations. And certainly, I would not go over this. These are some of the Italian works that exist uh, about Bolzano. Some of my work and the work of, of others. <coughs> the PowerPoint will be available. So if you want to follow some of this, uh, you can, you can easily, easily find it. And some more general bibliography about the interest of survival in Europe. And that I barely scratch, you know, the work of Richet, Schrenk, Notzin, all those people. Each of those individuals deserve a lecture on their own and still will not be possible to, to do them justice. But I hope that you get a more general view of the European interest of survival of bodily death. That we provide a balance. And so that you know, at least you are aware that it's not only the work of Myers in England or William James in the United States, but that there there were a lot of people in Europe concerned with this topic. And uh, perhaps in a in a future presentation, we may explore Latin America or get someone to do Asian places, you know, Japan, India, and uh, which also has had some psychical research tradition. And uh, but the whole point is to have a more general global view. So, so with that, I will close and thank you for your attention. And I'm open to questions. Um, anybody have any questions? Uh, one of the things that we were talking about when we were uh, chatting um, in the chat box is: uh, Are there any? Um, are there any or many uh, examples of ectoplasm these days? There are examples, yeah, of, of ectoplasm. I, I will argue that when we don't have are the very systematic and careful investigations of the old days, but we, we have mediums today that claim that they produce the phenomena. And, uh, you know, you, if, if you check the topic in the web, you will find examples of ectoplasm with photos. And, so, so yeah, there are people that still claim it, but it's not as frequent as it used to be. The, the phenomenon of ectoplasm is fascinating. And you, I just published an article about that, that topic in the Journal of, of Scientific Exploration. And uh, it's, it's basically an analysis of the historical literature from 19th century and the 1920s. Where especially in the 1920s is when ectoplasm yeah, it's being studied more, more carefully and in more detail. Still very controversial. And a lot of people still don't accept the finding. But just to, to, to give a, a short answer, yes, there are, there are still examples. There, there is a group called the Felix Group that, that has a website. If you look them on the Felix Group, you will find it. And they have a lot of photographs. And, they are controversial. They have been studied by, by Steve Browdy, and even Browdy will say that some of their stuff seems fraudulent, but it's, 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 it's very difficult. I cannot summarize it here. But if, if you search it, you'll find, yes, there, there are mediums today that are, that are presenting some evidence of ectoplasm. Any other questions, guys? Sorry for, for typing here. I'm trying to 
uh, give you the link to the JSC library. Oh, thank you, Brian. That's great. Um, all right, survivalafterdeath.info is a really great research for a uh, resource for a lot of information um, that's out archived and out there. And I'm also going to uh, put up um, a link to our publication page because a lot of our stuff that's there, it's not up to date, it only goes through 2014, but a lot of the stuff that's there is downloadable um, in, uh, uh, in PDF format. Any more questions, guys? Anybody have any more specific questions? Oh, uh, uh, Adelson is saying, Bozzano wrote about psychometrics. Is there any current evidence for psychometrics? And you want to define that for us? Yeah, he wrote about, about the phenomena of psychometry. Uh, psycho psychometry has been, has been studied since, at least since the 1850s. And, uh, <coughs> More recently, there has not been much attention. Generally, the claim is that you can get psychic impressions, veridical psychic impressions from objects. So to test for it, you you know you will get people, psychics particularly, and you will bring them an object, and you have the person touch the object and start talking about what visions or impressions they get. You will tape record all of that, and later you try to see if if the information really is truthful or not. Not a lot of people have, have done things recently in psychometry, but, but there have been a few. In Argentina, Alejandro Parra, eh, which we'll be talking later, giving a lecture later in this program, eh, he has done work of psychometry in recent years. Psychometry is difficult to interpret. Some people think that the object is really imprinted with some energy that provides information. Other people say that there is no such thing, that what is really happening there is that a person that has ESP abilities uses the object as a way to focus their ESP potential, and that the object really is not doing anything except a psychological And that still, you know, is, is being discussed. It has it has not been possible really to measure physically anything, anything in the object or, or even less, you know, in a house that you can say that that information is really encoded or imprinted there. In a way, the concept makes, makes some sense. And uh, it could be that we just are at a stage that we lack the technology, we lack the means to detect this type of influences, maybe in a hundred years or, or maybe tomorrow, someone will make a discovery or some type of technological application that will solve the problem. You know, it's hard to say. Well, not a lot of people today are, are studying psychology. Yeah, Brian noted, noted that uh, Bill Roll wrote a review on historical studies of psychometry um, that was in the JSE, and he gave us the link for that. Um, and Carlos, I picked up the link to your most recent uh, JSE on Dingwall's plasma theory. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that's the one I was I was saying about materializations yeah. and ectoplasm in general. The good mm -hmm. thing about that journal, Journal of Scientific Exploration, is once you publish there, it's available for free anyone in the world you know and you can go in and basically check check the journal and it's, it's something that i wish it was other journals will, will follow but yeah. you know, we're, we're still using the old models of tra trying to make money because you know you put money in printing the journal so you have to recover the money you cannot give it for free but slowly things are changing and i'm happy to see that that this journal is, is, is doing putting all that information out. Yeah, it's all it's all freely available. You can download individual articles or the full journal uh, for free without without joining the society. If you like what you see, joining the society is always a good idea because it helps them finance uh, the operation of the journal. But it's an amazing resource. And I'm with Carlos. I wish more people did that. 
Isn't Any other questions, you? guys? Sorry, sorry, Carlos. What? No, no, I'm saying that it's, it's hard to see that because someone has to pay for the editorial yeah. work. Yeah. For, you know, so that, there are reasons why the old model still is alive. So I'm happy to, to be seeing, you know, publication outlets are changing. And I think this information is going, to, I hope, will continue to become more freely available. Yeah. In your I hope that's true. And also check, um, as Brian's been putting things up, be sure you get on to Psychical Research Foundation and wander around because there's quite a lot of materials there, the old SATA journal and um, just a lot of materials that are available there from the Psychical Research Foundation, which was run by William G. Roll for a really long time. And he uh, was very much interested not only in psychometry, but in hauntings and uh, especially poltergeists and so on. Um, and there's uh, 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 Brian uh, and Brian writes the blog. So there's got to be lots of good information in the blog. I haven't re read a recent uh, post. There's also a wonderful blog out there. Well, first, Carlos's blog, for heaven's sake, if you haven't seen that yet, I'll put the uh, I'll put the link in the um, chat, but it's basically carlossalvarado.wordpress.com. It's called Parapsychology News History and Research, and it's um, full of bibliographic information, interviews with recent authors, um, uh, information about all kinds of special topics and so on, and that's a great place to keep abreast of what's going on and what has gone on in the past, because uh, Carl's is basically the field's premier historian. One, another, one thing, one thing that I like to do in the blog is to, to inform people about the digital resources that are available. A lot of the old literature, and by old, I mean, you know, defined by copyright, a lot of the things are before published before 1922. A lot of that is available for free in many different a digital libraries today. So all of you that are interested in the old materialization that you have been asking about and psychometry and the like, you can find a lot of that information for free in these libraries. If you go to my my blog, you, you can search on the digital libraries or bibliographical resources and you will find some some descriptions of some of those places. So that's 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 good news, you know. Now now a lot of that is available for free. Um, and I was going to say, if somebody can go out to the internet, I'm having difficulty um, doing that on the second screen without blinking out the the presentation on the that's being recorded. But um, uh, Andrea Summers, who's a who's a historian of science has a new blog called, well, it's been around for a while called Forbidden Histories, and he has a YouTube channel as well. And that's another a source of interesting discussions of a lot of these phenomena and other phenomena as well um, from a historical perspective. So that's, uh, if somebody can find that, that's great. Uh, that would be a good one. And I don't know, Brian, if you've got a link to Bill Roll's article on the psychometry experiments that he's done, if there's a section that's I think I put up the whole list of his published papers so you be able to get that from that um, link as well. Thanks, Morgan. Thanks, Esther. Um, any other questions about uh, Bozzano? He was a very interesting guy. He he was partially supported by, or mainly supported by his brother for a very long time. And um, when the war came, their fortunes changed drastically. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he he uh, unfortunately made a bonfire of what all of his correspondence and stuff and uh, some of his books and so on. So he, he uh, the last few years of his life were very challenging because of the, because of living in, in Italy with the war taking place basically right over the top of his head, if not right straight through his town. So that was difficult, but he did an enormous amount of uh, work and the Bozzano de Boni Library has a huge collection. And Carlos, did you mention the the um, indexes that they published? Um, no. And what and what that was based on? That might be a good no. they, they 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 publish 
Well, they have published several catalogs and interesting things, but they, they have a, a fascinating book that is it's all in Italian, but it's a multi-volume, it's like 10 volumes. And I, I have it just right here, up here. Uh, it's privately printed, but it's basically when, when Bozzano was compiling information to write all these articles and books was making annotations so if he was writing about mediums talking in other languages he, he will say okay where are the cases he says so one case here in this magazine in 1922 blah 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 one case in this book blah, blah, blah. and then he will list like 50 different ones that he found because as he was reading the psychic literature, he annotated his books. So later on, he put all that stuff and uh, that material survived. And these guys in the Bozzano, the, the Bonnie Library, let's see if I can go back to, the, to that slide. In this one foundation, it was basically the work of Silvio Ravaldini, which was the one that supported this foundation for a long time until he died a few years back. They use all, the, all those annotations that Bolsano had done and put it in the computer and created a big database. I mean, this is an amazing thing. When, when we were there, uh, they were very proud of it. And I remember Silvio Ravaldini basically saying, give me a topic. Give me a topic and I will find you some information. So I asked Nancy, well, Nancy, give me a topic. And I forget what Nancy said. Apparitions. I, I think, yes, apparitions. He said apparitions. And he yep. kind of smiled and he left the room. And then he came back some minutes later with a, a computer printout of several hundred references. I don't know how he entered the thing. He only put apparitions or what, but there, there were all kinds of references about cases of apparitions that had been published in psychical research and spiritualist magazines and journals and some of them in books. And so, you know, if you were looking for specific case descriptions, here you have hundreds to, to look for, you know, and they could do that with almost any topic, with ectoplasm, with psychometry, with bilocation, all kinds of things. So that, that's an amazing source. But unfortunately, you know, it was very expensive to print. These volumes I have never, they, ne they don't circulate, you know, I, I got it via someone in Italy and Massimo Biondi is a physician and a historian of Italian spiritism and psychical research. I have frequent contact with him. And every time I get stuck about something I don't know about Bozzano, I get into the emails and I ask Massimo. <laughs> and Massimo always knows. He, he has all that information. And so, you know, there are people there that are really dedicated and really into the story. But this material cannot survive, and it's just that it's not widely used because you know it's it's expensive to publish these all these catalogs, and uh, not everyone is interested in the old literature. But the resource is available, and I I use I use uh, the, those things sometimes to look for information you know, when I'm going to, to write something. And uh, it's part, I would say, of the legacy of Bolsano mm -hmm. still with us today, even if it's not widely you known. Well, and at the time, you got to remember <coughs> this was 1995. So he ran, uh, Silvio ran back to his office. We were having dinner with him and his wife because we were staying in Bologna for a few days. And a dot matrix printer, uh, matrix printer uh, made a lot of noise for quite a while, and we got 41 pages of individual uh, references to cases and not just cases where a publication was about the case and that's it, but also individual cases mentioned inside of different books and different, um, uh, different articles. So it was extremely useful because there was, it was more of a deep dive into 
uh, where you could find uh, uh, cases on apparitions. And I, so the 41 pages, I shared it with Nicolene Mayer, who was a, a ghost investigator at that point, and also sent a copy to Bill Roll. And I think I may have some another copy around somewhere here as well. But the, but his work was astonishing in the sense that it was so, um, so well done and so useful. It would be so great if, if they could find a donor to, to, you know, get his entire body of, of, of work out into English and, and Spanish and, you know, other languages as well. Very important, I think. Any other questions, guys? I think we're all stuck on psychometry at the moment <laughs> in the chat box. How many, how many those Bozanos are hiding in foreign languages? <laughs> and, uh, who else is doing this type of work or that doesn't get out into the Anglo, into the English language? <laughs> well, actually, I, I will say there are many Bozanos hiding. I mean, in, in the whole history of psychical research, there is a lot of people that have been forgotten mainly for the same reasons they, they have published in languages other than than English. They have published in Spanish, they have published in Italian, they have published in French. I was recently, for example, doing a very short article about a psychical researcher from France, Eugene Osti, and uh, most of Osti's work is still in French. He has not, I think one only one of his main books was translated into English. The others are in French. There's some Spanish translations, but that means that it's virtually unknown. People uh, do not read the languages or do not know, you know, where to find these things. There, there are many, many cases like that, and a lot of the information that is there is extremely useful. And uh, e e even if old, that doesn't mean that it's, it doesn't have uh, application or validity today. And at the very least, it can generate ideas and uh, you know, help us to, to do new studies or develop our theories. So yeah, I would say that there are many individuals like that. You go into the German literature, there are many people like that. You, the same in Spanish, the same in Italian, and uh, and and even in English, there is <laughs> a lot of people that were publishing a lot in the 1920s that have been forgotten today, or in the in the 19th century. That's one of the things that I enjoy in in my in my work. You know, that sometimes I find someone that that has been forgotten like that, and that appeals to me for some reason. And uh, so I, I do an article and I try to rescue that figure from the past. And I try to present a short biography and then say something about their work, sometimes present a, a long reprint from our, an excerpt from a chapter of a book or of an article. And a lot of those things I'm able to do because a lot of those things have been digitalized and I have access to it through some of these libraries that are online. It takes a lot of time going slowly and finding it and and then you know you're using the library facilities, many of them allow you to turn the PDF document you know into text and then I can just copy and paste and I leave a whole section and I'm able to do the work. But there there's a lot of unknown people that I still need to be rescued. So I guess I'm going to be busy for a while. We need some of that. Right <laughs> now I'm I'm still working in you know, in some some of that work. So it's a never ending task, but if you like it, you feel it's important and I also enjoy bringing out that information. You know, it's not it's not only the, the pure academic thing, it's also that I think, well, Maybe this thing that I'm doing will help someone today that is interested in it. So I, I have great pleasure in doing it. And if on top of that, I'm, I'm, I can help someone else by having access to this material, why not? You know? 
And uh, so I encourage some of you to do that. That's a, it's a, it's a very nice uh, task. And uh, you'll always be busy. There is so much to do. It's yeah, a never, a never ending task. So much there. And Cor Carlos reads uh, obviously Spanish and English, but also French and Italian and Portuguese. And, the, and that helps. But it leaves out um, all the Germanic languages and Scandinavian offshoots and all that kind of stuff. So there, it, there's a lot of room for people to be working in the other languages to get things out into Spanish and English and um, French and other languages. Um, and I wanted to ask Yarko if you have a link to Yanni's list um, of all the various articles that are around from uh, news items and stuff, he he posted it to our first paramount back in 2015. If you have a uh, um, have that handy, that would be great to put that up too. Um, so there there's a lot of uh, I think Carlos, one of the things you ought to do in your blog coming up is maybe a review of what's out there, what the sources out there are, are available for doing this type of research. Because I know back in the 90s. And early 2000s, you did a lot of articles on how to use Google to do research and so on. But um, it's worth going back to that because the resources have continued to grow over the decades. Well, I, I, I have a series, a series of blogs in which I have feed to particular digital libraries. Ah, good. You know, like Internet Archive, Google Books, Hathi Trust, which is one I use a lot. In France, there is Gallica. The, the online project of the National Library of France. It's an amazing uh, resource. And you know, you, it's, it's a normal database. You go in there and you, you type a name or a topic, or sometimes it's not that easy to research. You know, sometimes you have to put a lot more time. But if you put the time and you have the patience, you need patience, can find a lot of these materials, a lot of these rare books are out there. Many of these libraries will let you download the book. So, you know, you can have hard disk copies of a, a lot of these things. And uh, so, yeah, now we, ha we have the means to, to have access to that without leaving home. I mean, I, I do all my research right here via this computer. And uh, I don't have, in the old days, I would have had to have resources to go to big libraries in France, and to go to Washington, you know, to the Library of Congress, to, to, to go to, to England for to the British Library. Uh, that's why only very few people could do very detailed work of that sort, but now things have changed. You, know, you have access. Of course, not everything is available. There are still things that have not been scanned. And uh, then there are things that cannot be scanned because of copyright laws. So if you have something, and I don't have access to most things published after 1922, I still don't have access. So, you know, there's things for the late, the late 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. Luckily for me, I'm interested more in the old period. So my main interest is, is very well represented in the content of these libraries. But I encourage you to explore it. And remember that all these libraries, it's not only psychic stuff. If you're interested in history, in literature, in archaeology, in whatever topic it is, there are millions, and I'm not exaggerating, millions of references available there on almost any topic, in different languages that are there waiting for so, it's and it's only going to get better, I'm sure, yes. because so many people are doing uh, scanning projects and setting up websites and databases and updating databases and so on. Um, I'll also I've written down Carlos's blog uh, on research resources, and I'm I'm going to do a lot of uh, stuff for Paramook today after the session is over. So I'll get a bunch of this stuff up onto the course schedule, um, and also. Um, uh, oh, I just lost it. Oh, I'm going to put up a link on, uh, um, I've forgotten what I called it. Oh, the Primer series, which was which is on Parapsychology Online. 
it there's six I think 15 or 16 introductions to different websites um around the field that are uh, great sources of information and there's a one of them is on lexine.org and this is the uh database of the parapsychology uh, excuse me of the journal for of the society for psychical research i'll get it one of these tries yeah. the society for psychical research it's got an old interface um, and it can be a pain in the butt to use, but it's got but it's a, worth it. yeah, it's really worth it. It's got a very deep, um, uh, a very deep list of things from the, not only the JSPR, but other, other sources as well, as well as some full text of some I, books. I have one of, one of my blogs is about Lexi. Good. Okay. Yeah. And you I can have find it there. there and I give examples of the type of materials. I give you know, specific examples of the articles that you can find. Almost everything that Frederick Myers wrote, for example, you can find there. And did you do did you do anything on the doesn't Ions or Mike Murphy or somebody have some of these books also in full text? Ions. It might not be Ions. I mean Esselin, um, Mike Murphy and Esselin. Didn't they have Myers in full text they, there as well? I think yeah. I think they have Myers. Well, Myers is everywhere. Oh, every, good. <laughs> every digital library that is good enough, you know, will have Myers' book of Human Personality and His Survival of Bodily Death, the two volumes. They will have it available. And they also will have uh, old runs of the proceedings of the Society for Psychical Research. That's where Myers started to publish his ideas from early on from about 1884 till the 1890s. And you see, you know, a lot of his discussions of multiple personality, of, of hypnotic experiments in France, his, his own ideas about the subliminal mind, his critiques of the work of people like Pierre Janet in France. And, you know, you, you find the whole Myers here, right there. And that's available in, in Google Books, in Half a Trust, and in several other uh, library projects. So there is a lot there. Any other questions, guys, or comments? We're, we're getting close to the two hour mark here. We had a great discussion in the background as well. Lots of links again. Um, Marla and Esther, Esther, I'm leaning on you guys to copy the chat if you can. That was so helpful last time. Yeah, here uh, Brian has posted Esalen Center for Theory and Research website and their HTML copy of Meyer's books. If you ever get into Second Life, I know not a lot of you won't. But the, there are some of these books up on the, you know, links to some of these books up on the virtual computer. <coughs> so I'll be over there this afternoon updating as well. I'm going to just be paramook all day. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, Carlos, for yet another amazing. I listen to his talks all the time. We've been together 36 years, and I swear to God, I learn something new every single time I pay attention because he's always find, finding more and more resources and more and more materials and uh, looking at things from different perspectives and so on. And that's really wonderful. And there's more coming, Nancy. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know he works so hard. I feel, I feel terrible. I, I do housework and knit and other things, but he's constantly working. So that's a, that's a big plus. We've got a, we've got a, a bibliographic and interpretational uh, resource here. Well, let me uh, move on just a sec to uh, talk about what's next up on the schedule. Tomorrow, we've got uh, Jan Holden, who's the editor of the Journal of Near-Death Studies. She's a professor of counseling uh, education at the University of North Texas. We had um, our, our, uh, we had our practice session yesterday, and the PowerPoint is extremely good. I've got a, I've got the current copy of it that I'll be uploading in the activity space for this week um, later on today. It includes two uh, MP4 uh, videos of near-death experiencers talking about their experiences, one of which is about 20 minutes long. She's a very articulate person. Those will be uploaded separately uh, because the conversion process to WizIQ takes out the the live links to the um, to the animations and to the 
uh, uh, to the videos, but that'll be up there. So that's tomorrow at noon Eastern, Sunday, April 14th. I will be um, uploading an edited version of my recording of, of this session to YouTube later on this afternoon. And then the, the official with a Q recording will be available within 24 hours on the live classes uh, list under the path tab. So um, everything will be available. At, we're up to 127 uh, students in the course, which is just really exciting. I hope you will go and uh, get on the Induce, introduce yourself discussion forum if you haven't done that uh, yet and tell us a little bit about yourself and say hello to some of your colleagues. I am going to be uh, filming some of these tutorials this afternoon and getting them up as well about setting up your profile and so on. It's always great to have a picture or something <laughs> that represents you on the um, uh, on, on the discussion forums. We also have the notes and updates discussion forum is available and I'm putting the up the links to the YouTube videos that are on the Paramook playlist on the Parapsychology Foundation YouTube channel. Um, and I will be pulling in the recordings from the past tab of live classes into the schedule, I think. I think I finally figured out how to do that. So hopefully that'll go up this afternoon as well. Remember that you, I, every time I write you, I tend to send you the schedule again. I hope you guys don't mind that, but I just wanted to make sure everybody's got the links. Um, and all of the uh, biographies and abstracts that I have so far are also going to go up this afternoon on the Google Calendar. The um, and um, um, the Google Calendar and onto the course descriptions. That's what I was trying to get to. And ultimately, when I get the whole crowd, they'll all be up in a PowerPoint at the top of the schedule. So I hope you've been enjoying things. I hope you're finding everything you need. Um, We'll have the chat log chat log uh, soon, and I'll put that up as well. And I'm going to try and harvest the links from the first ha uh, the first uh, last week and from this week as well. So you have just a a links uh, page as well that I'll put up. Oh, I'm glad that you're getting to use the Google Calendar, and I'm going to go through with the past stuff and just change the wording a little bit so it's clear that you can get the recordings off that link and. Put, it, put in the YouTube uh, uh, links because um, uh, a number of people find that more more convenient. I know I do in the online courses that I take and it also helps the two or three people that we have from Second Life that have uh, signed up for the course and are using my calendar, um, my quote unquote physical calendar uh, in the Azire Library and Learning Center to to get their links for the course and for the YouTube videos. So. So that's all the housekeeping. So thanks everybody for coming. I'm really glad uh, that you were all here. Thanks Marla for copying the chat and anybody else who did that too. And as uh, let me just pop in our emails again. If you have any questions about anything specifically, you're looking for something that we've written that you can't get a hold of, um, just give us an, uh, drop us a, an email um, and we'll be happy to take care of that. So thanks, Carlos, for another marvelous uh, uh, presentation. And thanks to all you guys for welcome. showing up live. And thanks to everybody who's watching the YouTube or the in-course uh, um, recording of this. We're glad that you're here virtually, even if you can't be with us in the live sessions. And remember, we've got lots of room left in the course. So if you have anybody who's interested in coming into the course and having access to all these materials, um, <coughs> please share the course links. We'd be delighted about that. So thanks so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye now. Carlos, say goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>